And now Sir Alec Guinness from the choir pulpit will give the address. When Larry Olivier died, two lines of Shakespeare came to mind. The star is fallen and time is at his period. The long day's task is done. And his life of 82 years had been a long task, filled to the brim with hard work, great achievement, and during the past decade or so, with his valiant and all but victorious fight against constant wretched illness. His courage and determination were phenomenal, as was even in old age, though I find it difficult to think of him as old. His physical energy on those days when he was not crippled by his disorders. As an actor, he stands alongside the acknowledged great, Burbage, Betterton, Garrick, Keane, and Irving. Even allowing for violent changes of fashion, I feel that each of those tremendous actors of the past would have recognized him, applauded, and welcomed him as one of their own. The theatrical profession is notorious for its extravagance both in praise and blame. Quite minor or wayward acting, which only catches, like Osric in Hamlet, the tune of the time, is sometimes hailed as great. It is a much abused word, but a vastly refreshing one when it can be used with total confidence, as it can of Olivier. I wouldn't be sure how to define it when applied to an actor, but it is easily recognizable when seen. Perhaps it consists of a happy combination of imagination, physical magnetism, a commanding and appealing voice, an expressive eye, and danger. Larry always carried the threat of danger with him, primarily as an actor, but also for all his charm as a private man. There were times when it was wise to be wary of him. This danger was most evident, I think, in his comic parts. Not altogether surprisingly, I suggest, as many comedians appear to have a quick eye and ear for not only what is funny, but also for what is cruel. And Larry was a supreme comedian. We all know of or saw his pinnacle performances in the classics, Romeo, Oedipus, Henry V, Richard III, his Hotspur, Macbeth, Coriolanus, Othello, and Lear. But side by side with these, I would place the smallish parts of Justice Shallow, Captain Brazen in The Recruiting Officer, and Mr. Puff in The Critic. The delightful, self-regarding, almost feminine way he removed the little tricorn hat he wore as Mr. Puff and stabbed it with a gigantic hat pin was a highlight of brilliant timing and mincing absurdity. I don't know how he set about his work as an actor, probably very privately and from the outside in, so to speak. He quickly formed an image of what he wanted to look like in a part. That was an anchor for him. He needed all the practicalities to be clear and firm before he could infuse his spirit into what he was playing. I have the impression that when studying a script, his imagination would alight on a phrase or two which he would then emphasize extraordinarily. Sometimes I've thought, I don't believe that line's in the play. He must have made it up. But sure enough, it was there, and he had been right to draw attention to it. I'm not altogether sure, though, that he was right in altering a particular piece of punctuation when playing Malvolio but the result was undoubtedly funny. He changed the line when Manvolio interrupts Sir Toby and Sir Andrew Acucci Confesti in their midnight carousal from my masters, are you mad or what are you? To my masters, are you mad or what are you?
Of course, in these days of some very peculiar productions, that would pass unnoticed. <laughs> To see him act, Coleridge wrote of Keane, is like reading Shakespeare by flashes of lightning. Some of us might prefer a steadier light, but Larry provided the flashes often enough. Sometimes we've read in the press over the past 20 years or more of a young actor being hailed as a second Olivier. That is nonsense, of course, and unfair to the actor. If he is of outstanding talent and character, then he will carve out his career in his own right and in his own name. He won't be a second anyone. In any case, there may be imitators, but there is no second Olivier. He was unique. His first really big impact in the theater was in 1935, when he appeared as Romeo at the new theater, now the Albury, he presented a beautiful, graceful, Italianate youth, gentle, passionate, highly strung, and desperate with love. His reading of the line towards the end of the play, Then I Defy You, Stars, was so searing, it seemed to wither the world of romance. He could do that sort of thing, boldly and alarmingly. <laughs> 